Launch is the most dangerous thing I've ever done. Five months in space, and half of the risk of five months in space is in the first nine minutes. We can see more and more of the horizon. All of a sudden, we can see the whole sphere. A great, gigantic blue ball covered with a white lace of clouds. As we travel along at 17,500 miles an hour, almost immediately we begin the rendezvous process to approach the space station. The two vehicles orbiting about 214 statute miles above the Atlantic Ocean. One meter away from capture. I could just never get enough. Auroras are amazing. It looks like a ghost out there, and you can actually see it moving and dancing with your eye in real time. And from the vantage point of space, it's different than seeing it from planet Earth because there's no intervening atmosphere. It's a very emotional time to see the S-1 truss and to fly around the station in a big arc, uh, which is what we do. We could look at the station from all different angles. The reason why we do that is to take pictures. We're documenting the station as it exists in this configuration, both for future crews and also for maintenance. Station Houston on two. So station, we copy and order. The Dragon continued to uh, wait. Holding at the capture point. The station's robotic arm that will reach out and grapple the SpaceX cargo ship, uh, the top portion of which is the only uh, cargo vehicle that returns intact. Returning cargo and scientific experiments of all of the international uh, fleet. I equate looking out the window at the Earth kind of like when you go camping and you could just sit and look at the campfire for hours, be mesmerized. It is such an experience at so many levels, just straight at the awareness level when you open your eyes and look at the world. It is, it is as if this huge living thing next to you is very uh, deliberately showing you its secrets. It's like you thought that last orbit around was interesting? Look at this. Within the astronaut corps, there are a lot of us, people from all around the world. There's every religion. On orbit, we really respect each other's beliefs. Beliefs are what got us there. And whatever belief system gave you the strength to do all the things you needed to do in order to be one of the first humans to see the world that way, that belief system is a good one. One of the reasons why we want to share this experience as much as we can, because I, I think we would have uh, you know, a lot less problems. Uh, I think uh, some of the challenges that we face would be more easily solved if uh, you know, everybody had that perspective.
we saw a lot of typhoons and cyclones and hurricanes over the six months, but the eye of that thing was humongous, and we had this one pass that just happened to go directly over. We're looking down in this giant, you know, bucket. You see that, that line that separates day and night slowly moving across the planet. Thunderstorms on the horizon casting these long shadows as the sun sets. The events you see from space, like flying over thunderstorms, looking at them from the top were spectacular. Like a fireworks show going on and you're looking at it from the very top. We'd actually just seen the storms in the South Pacific over the Philippines and uh, it was nighttime, thunderstorms lighting up the entire sky. The incredible energy and the power of the nature of the Earth is very evident. This is the largest one I'd ever seen. It must have extended several thousand miles. that were the size of cities. I mean, it was just so, so magnificently, effortlessly powerful. It's uh, 28 reaction control system jets behaving normally. The HTV-4 approaches at a rate of just one inch per second. You can perform steps two through four in your robotics procedure one decimal three two zero. The robotics officer here in mission control reports the arm in motion. You have a go for release. Release confirmed. Stand aboard and armed. Copy arm. And I had studied um, astronomy and I had studied cosmology and fully understood that uh, the molecules in my body, the molecules in my partner's bodies and in the spacecraft had been prototyped in some ancient generation of stars. In other words, it was pretty obvious uh, from those descriptions were stardust. did not feel we'd had enough to do on this mission, so we uh, were able to deploy a couple of satellites. It's up there right now investigating solar cell technology. It actually was supposed to come apart, as you see here. 
and you can really see orbital mechanics in work there. The International Space Station now in free drift. Most of the vehicles, except for the SpaceX vehicle, burn up in the atmosphere when they come back down. The Soyuz spacecraft in view. Three dropped. Okay, we copy. The most bad. Less than 50 meters separating the two vehicles, and everything going well. They're using their course automated docking system. Right there's no lines, no lateral. I would say we're good. But we need me to Less than four meters out. Contact and capture confirmed. I was on the dark side of the world over the Indian Ocean and I shut off all the lights in my suit to let my eyes adjust. We drove through the southern lights and, and they were like pouring underneath my feet and you could see all the colors of it. And, I mean, I'd seen aurora from on the surface of the Earth, but to be amongst them, to actually directly be part of that interaction between the sun and the atmosphere and the magnetic field, all right there visually like, like a prism or a rainbow or something. That was a real reality check of how it's all related. It really showed me that this is a system. This is a planetary system. This goes on all the time. Most of the time, though, we just don't see it. But this is going on constantly, all the time, how all those things work together. From orbit, you get that type of perspective. Earth is 16 times bigger in area than the, than the moon, and it's also more reflective. And because of the oceans, that light is decidedly blue. You see the vastness of space, and you see how, you know, just utter blackness, and then you see this absolutely glowing, beautiful, uh, you know, spacecraft that we're all riding through the universe on, the spacecraft we call Earth. One of the neat effects is you get 16 sunrises and sunsets. We're circling the Earth every hour and a half. I've been up here for about three weeks and I have never thought about my mobile phone once. But we are not disconnected from our family and friends up here. We have uh, access to the internet and then we have uh, the possibility of giving them a call. It's fun to call your friends and, and say, hey, I'm calling you from the space station. Looks like you're having crummy weather down there.
right there is our water reclamation system. So that is actually taking all of our urine and our sweat and it's sending it through this filter and it's putting it right back into our water supply. We can strip the hydrogen off that and vent the oxygen out into the cabin so we can breathe it. You never want to hear about a fire in space. The Flex 2 experiment burned fuel droplets to see how they react without gravity. My experiment is a droplet combustion experiment to understand how uh, liquid fuels burn in microgravity so that we can use them efficiently and also cleanly by understanding how the chemistry works. This is called low temperature uh, combustion. When we go into a frontier, a normal earth code intuition no longer applies. This works when you go to the bottom of the ocean or in the stratosphere or, or wherever you find your frontier under the stage of an electron microscope. Your normal everyday life intuition no longer applies. And that's why frontiers are rich in discovery because things aren't the normal, they aren't the usual. Whatever we have the will to do, we have the, uh, the technology and we have the uh, ability to do, uh, we just have to choose to do it and, and go for it. Um, whether that's going to Mars, whether that's uh, you know, uh, creating a lunar outpost, you know, whatever we decide to do with the future of humanity, I think that we can accomplish anything that we set our minds to. Nice flight path here, we should be able to make it. I think the experience of living and working together in zero-G is just such a magic environment that it just made us feel very close. It made us feel like a family as we prepare to close the hatch and get ready for undocking. in motion as Atlantis conducts the final RBAR pitch maneuver in shuttle program history. Now going subsonic, the fleet leading shuttle announcing its arrival at the landing site with a pair of sonic booms the late afternoon sunshine gleaming off its thermal protection heat shield. Runway inside Houston, fire looks great. Discovery, we got it. We came down about 350 miles an hour. As we round out and pull out of our dive, Ham lowered the landing gear, and we lined up on the, on the center line and flared Atlantis out for a landing. There's no power here. This is our only chance to land, so we've got to do it right the first time. Now I'm deploying the drag chute. Atlantis, we'll stop. Roger, we'll stop Atlantis. That was a picture perfect end to a top fueled mission to the space station. Everybody, welcome back to Earth.